Well, hello, I'm Martin Green uh, speaking to you from Sydney. Well, today I'll be talking about the grand history and future of silicon solar cells, but I'd like to start um, a little bit on Becquerel. So uh, the first time I really looked at his work was when I was invited uh, to give an opening address at the 21st IEEE conference in Florida. And um, uh, it, you know, I decided to play on the 21st theme and talk a little bit about the, how photovoltaics had grown up. So I went over the history and uh, during this, I looked at uh, some of Becquerel's original paper papers and tried to sketch the, um, the type of apparatus he might have been using. And that's the sketch I came up with with the help of Dr. Elaine Prigg, who was able to read the French, unlike me. Mm -hmm. Uh, later on, another person in our group found uh, this photo here. So uh, Brecker was a little bit more conservative in the use of uh, platinum and uh, also had things tilted on its side from what I deduced from the paper. Anyhow, uh, I went on to uh, talk about the way the solar cell history had evolved from that early stage. And uh, you know, the next big step was when Adams and Day you know, detected a solid state um, photovoltaic effect in selenium. And uh, I got a bit closer with um, with those drawings. So this is a photo that um, John Perrin, who had written those great books on solar, on the history of solar, he actually located these specimens in a London museum. And, uh, you know, it wasn't too bad, that drawing. Um, the next big um, step forward was um, Smith, uh, Fritz from the US, who in 1883 made the thin film photovoltaic device by squishing some selenium onto a copper plate and a leaf of gold over the top. But the amazing thing was John Perlin found this photo here and Fritz actually made a whole array. So this is probably the first ever photovoltaic system installed on a roof in uh, New York. Uh, so uh, things went on and um, I guess with the development of quantum mechanics, it became possible to understand the processes that were going on in photovoltaics. So Walter Schottke was very influential here, as you'll see, but he uh, deduced the theory of metal to silicon or semiconductor, <laughs> more correctly, contacts uh, in 1938. And that was very timely because uh, not long after, um, Russell Ohl at Bell Labs was experimenting with silicon for cat's whisker type um, microwave um, rectifiers. Um, but he was trying to make some very pure silicon and um, he found uh, when he um, cut some specimens of silicon from this ingot that he'd cast, um, that he could generate uh, photo voltage. And, um, he uh, realized there was a junction between two different types of materials. One he called positive material and the other called negative because one went positive under light and the other negative. So that's the origin of the P and N type material. Um, but um, he understood that there must have been a, a barrier along there similar to the barrier that Schottky had detected at a metal to semiconductor interface. So the work of Schottky was very influential in understanding what was going on in these devices. And uh, it also led to the understanding of the role of dopants in silicon. So in a certain way, uh, the photovoltaics was responsible for the understanding of silicon and other semiconductors that led to the microelectronics revolution. Um, so William Shockby figured out the theory of these PN junctions, wrote a paper in 1949 that um, is probably better than most papers that are written on that topic today. So understood things better than most people do today about the, how the PN junction worked. So the theory was really understood then. Then microelectronics or semiconductor electronics, I guess more correctly, got ahead of photovoltaics and photovoltaics played a back seat. But some of the developments that have, had occurred for semiconductor electronics were then applied to photovoltaics in 1953. And uh, the first efficient silicon solar cell was reported then. So first 4% and then 6% with the uh, wraparound structure that you can see there. Um, made front page news on the New York Times, uh, it's a little article there, vast power of the sun is tapped by battery using sand ingredients. And there's all kinds of hope for the way you might use it with the family there with the solar array and so on. But uh, the cells were then far too expensive to be used for anything except on spacecraft. 
And that was an application that the cells soon found. So 1958, they were used on Vanguard. Then in 1962, uh, Telstar was launched, that was the uh, first communication satellite, but there was a lot of um, specific cell development to get the cells ready for the Telstar mission. And uh, the cells reached a standardized geometry that was to stay in vogue for a decade. Uh, when I first joined the field, it was called the conventional space cell. So six fingers on a two centimeter by two centimeter cell, very heavy diffusion at the top to keep the contact resistance down and the lateral uh, diffusion resistance between the fingers low. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, there was a dead layer at the surface. Um, Joseph Lindmayer, um, there was a lab concept that was set up, I think 69, to uh, improve satellite technology. And one of the technologies they decided to look at was uh, solar cells. And Joseph Lindmayer was given the job of improving solar cell performance. So he identified the role this dead layer was playing. and found ways of getting around it and generally improved the um, cell performance quite substantially over you know, what was quite typical then. So about 15% efficient cells he was able to demonstrate with what was called the violet cell because the uh, anti-reflection coatings that were used uh, gave it a violet, violet appearance. Not long after, um, Comsat also developed the black cell. Joseph had already left to set up SolarX, which is one of the big companies of the 80s in the US. Uh, big solar companies, but uh, Comsat introduced texturing. So some of these selective etches had been used in microelectronics and Comsat realized that you could use it to uh, texture the cells. So this black cell, because it looked black, um, uh, you know, it formed the forerunner of the cell that has for long dominated the commercial solar cell industry, the aluminium back surface field cell. So aluminium back surface fields had been understood since the late sixties. And then uh, with this texturing and the improvements that Joseph had um, developed at Comsat, um, you know, you could get quite respectable efficiencies. So some of the black cells were over 16% efficient. I don't think any got over 17, but somewhere between 16 and 17% efficient. That's actually the year that I set up the lab at UNSW, 1974. So that was the state of play when, um, when I joined. And on the little chart here just shows the efficiency evolution of these different technologies that I've been talking about. So all of this early uh, developmental work, you know, all the records at least were set in the US. Um, the oil embargoes of the early 80s started a, a very uh, effective program in the US the flat plate solar array project that went, ran from 1975 to 1985. And what it did, I think its lasting contribution was development of the module technology that we use today. So at the beginning of the project, um, the, the, the project called for block purchases of um, modules. So at the beginning of the project, um, you know, there was all different kinds of scatty ideas we used to make these modules. But by the end of the project, modules were starting to look pretty modern. So the um, laminated um, encapsulation using screen printed um, black cells were the um, were be become the norm, as you can see there, so squared off cells. So some of those modules that were um, supplied in 1985 don't look too much different from present day modules, at least until recently. And the uh, module in the background there, um, yeah, it looks quite modern. Um, that's when we uh, started to get involved. So um, we were working on um, uh, improving the performance of cells and we hit the jackpot in 1983 when we made our first 18% efficient cell. And that's the small team that uh, we're responsible for all this. Um, but uh, you can see a photo of it there, but some of those people went on to play a major role in the uh, development of the industry, as I'll mention. But what we did that was a little bit different was we realized the role that oxide passivation could play in improving the cell performance. So we used it to what we describe as fixing up the top surface of the cell. So increasing the voltage by reducing recombination along the top surface, even sticking the um, oxide under the contact, uh, which is an idea that has resurfaced um, more recently. So tunneling uh, oxide type devices to ensure the maximum passivation light right along the surface. 1983 was also a big year and that was the year that I personally invented the perk cell. So this is my first drawing of a perk that I included in a couple of reports that I wrote at the end of 1983. Um, 
and uh, the perk, as we'll see, has gone on to become a major player in the industry. Also, the same year, we actually reported the first Topcon solar cell, a tunneling oxide polycrystalline contact cell. Um, and we got quite good results of it reported in that paper in 1983. We set a world record for voltage using that approach um, outside of our group, at least. We had got um, well ahead of the rest of the field by that stage using these tunneling types of contacts. We uh, got our first 20% uh, efficient cell in 1985, and this is the team that um, uh, developed that cell. And uh, even more of the people in that picture went on to have an impact on the industry. Several CTOs of future solar cell uh, goliaths within that um, photo there. Um, our uh, run of uh, records was interrupted by Stanford University, and uh, there's Dick Swanson underneath me there. <laughs> I'm, I'm overlaid on him. But uh, they were working on a very innovative structure where the, um, uh, where the light came from uh, the front surface, sh cells shown upside down, contacts all over the back. But um, it required good passivation all over the cell, and uh, that sort of stimulated us to to start fixing up the back. We'd fixed up the front of the cell and we figured we had to start fixing up the back. So that led to the um, PERC cell as it's known these days. And that took us through from 22% um, efficiency up to 25, which is sort of a trajectory that the industry is now following. Uh, since then, um, most of the developments have occurred in the uh, commercial companies. So SunPower took over where uh, um, Stanford left off, Dick Swanson's team transferred to SunPower and um, they uh, took the efficiency also to 25% with very elegant looking cells. And then the heterojunction technology Panasonic followed a very similar de development tra trajectory as you can see on this graph to SunPower and also getting very close to 25% with the uh, heterojunction technology. We uh, got into 25 um, with um, the PERC cell technology several years earlier. Um, in 2014, Panasonic broke through the 25% barrier with the, by combining um, heterojunction technology with the Stanford approach. So using uh, heterojunction technology in a rear contact type cell shown there. And then more recently, Kanika have taken that further 26.7, which remains the highest efficiency for a silicon cell that's been reported to date. Also a rear contact device. Commercially, however, the success has been PERC. So the gray and yellow regions are PERC in this, this chart. So this year it'll account for over 86% of production. Also a bit of the black region is PERC technology as well. So completely dominating the industry with a more limited role being played by the heterojunction and um, rear contact type cell designs. So finish up, I'll just talk what might come after PERC. So I think the answer is a tandem cell on silicon. It's got to be that to, uh, to get substantial gains in efficiency. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with the idea of stacking higher band gap cells on silicon, but I think there's a natural commercial path in initially stacking them onto silicon. So um, stacking one cell on silicon is going to be a bit of a challenge, but uh, we're going to get a big jump in efficiency by doing that. And then once you stack one cell onto silicon, you might as well stack two. And uh, so I can see a, a three cell stack um, involving silicon as being a natural development of the industry in that the existing manufacturers with their huge um, turnovers um, able to participate in that uh, development and commercialization. So where will that take us in efficiency? So if they um, can get to the same fraction, I think we'll see 25% perks in production ultimately. So if they can get to the same fraction of the limiting efficiency with the um, triple junction cell, you know, something around 40% is what you'll see at the cell level at least. Um, so um, what might come after that? I think, I think that might be as far as you can take silicon. So I think the next stage after that might um, getting to a three cell tandem stack with silicon might be the end of the run for silicon in that in a three cell stack, the contribution of the silicon cell is cut down to a third of what it would be if it was a standalone silicon device. So if you go to a four cell stack, you're only getting a quarter of the total contribution from the uh, silicon cell from what it would be by itself. Also, manufacturers would have gained um, experience 
with these thin film technologies that you're stacking onto silicon and start to feel very comfortable with them and their durability and reliability and so on. So you'd ask the question, you know, why would you need silicon after that? So I can see, you know, by the mid-century, us evolving to a, a four cell thin film stack and then going on five, six, you know, maybe even more manufacturers are like these incremental improvements. So each cell would give you an incremental improvement. So I, I can see that as a future of silicon is to do itself out of business by helping the development of thin film technologies and commercializing of these in huge volumes and gaining the confidence needed to eventually go to an all thin film technology sometime after mid-century. So thanks very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure to present at the conference. Thank you.